welcome Satosh. Thank you for taking the time. And we are dying to hear your, what you say on the subject. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much, Rajesh. Pleasure to be here and uh, share my thoughts and uh, the little presentation that I've put together. So let me uh, share my screen here so that you can see it. All right, I want to start. I mean, the theme uh, that's been uh, given to me uh, today is raising environmental consciousness, as you could see on the cover slide here. So I want to start by really trying to understand what exactly we mean by that. I know uh, some of these things we take for granted, but sometimes uh, certain uh, misconceptions linger. And also there are certain nuances that we need to be aware of. So this is the dictionary definition of consciousness, a person's awareness or perception of something. But to me, the key here is perception. And perception is not possible without experience, without experiencing something. Otherwise, you just have an imagination of it. You have a sort of a secondhand uh, a version of what it actually is, whereas perception is more firsthand. So this will become important a little later. We'll see why. Secondly, environment. So here the key thing to me is that the environment is not some sort of utopia or idyll, which is hanging somewhere very far, which we need to protect. That is happening already. We have a lot of protected areas, not a lot, I would say, but we have some protected areas where conservation is done uh, in a very organized way. And uh, that is anyway there, but becoming conscious about the environment is realizing that the environment is wherever we are. So wherever we go, we're still on earth and we have an environment around us, which is in fact the most impacted by our presence and by our activities. So I think the first step is to understand that the environment is right outside our house, in our garden, on our street, in our locality and in our city. So those are the two key definitions I would like to uh, begin with. And so this is an example of um, uh, what I mean by environment. Uh, so this is the Jam Sahib statue right in the middle of a bustling city called Jamnagar. I'm sure many of you would have heard of it because it's uh, famous for its oil refineries. And uh, this is a big swarm of rosy starlings, a murmuration of starlings, if I have to be more specific, um, which uh, puts on this spectacular show every evening in the winter particularly. And if I cut to a wide angle shot, you can actually see how it is in context. So it's right in the middle of a bustling town uh, within a lake. So the environment is really in our backyard and can be anywhere. This is actually the, um, one of the temples in Cambodia, the Bayon temple. And you have a pair of macaques uh, copulating right in front of the Buddha statue. So increasingly, uh, the picture seems uh, sort of distorted that animals are actually invading our territory and so on, but it's actually the other way around. We have set up civilization uh, in what used to be the, uh, the property, so to speak, of nature, uh, which is why uh, it's very important that we tread carefully wherever we are. There could be forms of life that we could be destroying every moment uh, with our ignorance. So why be conscious is a question that I will not go into because I'm sure there are other eminent panelists here who will talk about uh, very scientifically uh, the situation on the ground. Uh, but suffice it to say that we've come to a period where it's no longer enough for an organization or an NGO or um, a body or even a government to be working. We've come to a time where each of us needs to contribute uh, to improve the state of our environment. Uh, so I think that is all I'll say on why there is a need for us to be conscious. So I will speak more about how to become conscious. And uh, this is obviously the topic that's been uh, entrusted uh, to me. So I will share my experiences of how I became at least what I think conscious and uh, perhaps what can work and what may not work when we are trying to uh, proliferate this consciousness through society. So I think there are three phases or stages that are uh, essential components in this journey of becoming environmentally conscious. Uh, the first, uh, so the, the three stages kind of make a very convenient uh, acronym, which is very easy to remember, which is EAT, which is what the panda is thinking about here. But, um, it really stands for experience, awareness, and transmission <clears throat> as the last stage in the process. So I'll take you through what I mean by each of them in detail. So the first being experience. Now, this is 
a graphical representation of, I think, why experience is important. And what, what I mean by experience is actually physically being present in a space that can affect you, either positively or negatively. But when you're in nature, it's mostly positive uh, you know, experience that you have. And this is because if you look at this graph, I hope it's not too difficult to understand, but the blue circle represents what can be saved, what it's not too late to save, what can regenerate, what can be preserved or can be conserved. Within that, you have a smaller gambit of what you've heard of, right? There may be places you've never heard of, there may be animals you've never heard of, there may be issues you've never heard of. So there's that little black circle of the things that you've heard of, but that has absolutely nothing to do with what you've experienced because no matter how much you hear of things, read them in the newspaper, maybe even watch a wildlife film or environment film, uh, it doesn't really move you the way what you've experienced does, which is an even smaller circle because there's a limit to how much you can do and how much you can experience. And then what you care about is an even smaller circle within that circle of what you've experienced. But hopefully that circle is as big as possible uh, within that because we tend to care about most of the things that we've experienced. Uh, and then lastly, there is that small bit that you will make an effort to save. Uh, which is the smallest subset of this entire picture. So it's very clear that we'll never save something that we do not care about. I mean, whether it's the avenue of uh, sport uh, or the avenue of uh, environment or the avenue of um, what have you, uh, a certain uh, tradition maybe, uh, an art form, a language, we only say what we care about. So it's as simple as that. So how do we learn to care more about things. I mean, I could show you this picture and tell you about how the grass smelled, how green everything felt. This is an Amboseli National Park in Kenya. Uh, how dramatic the sky was, how gentle the elephant was and all of that. And you say, yeah, 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 beautiful, awesome, great. And you'll probably even comment on it, but you'll never really know how it feels uh, to be there unless you're actually there. Um, so the key to this is to come to experience the value of what we are talking about. We need to see the value in preserving uh, the environment uh, the way it is supposed to be. Um, not the economic value, of course. I mean, we have other ways of uh, taking care of that. But the intangible uh, perceptional value of how it can feel when you have a pristine environment around you, uh, when you have birds chirping around you, when you have crickets uh, you know, chirping at night, uh, so that is the value that we need to learn to see. Now, how do we see that value? We have a bit of a chicken and egg situation uh, going on with most of us that unless we experience something, we will not see the value. And unless we see the value or unless we are shown the value by someone, we'll not care to experience it. So this is a chicken and egg situation that we have to break somehow. Uh, there is no set formula for this. And I think if we are vulnerable enough, if we are open enough, uh, we can uh, break out of it. Some of us are very lucky, very fortunate. I mean, I, for one, was introduced to the wilds as a young uh, boy when I was about seven or eight years old by my maternal uncles who took me to forests and uh, for all sorts of things like trekking, mountaineering, river crossing, all sorts of adventures. So I was very fortunate. But I think today we have a lot of mainstream media. We have social media. We have an absolute surplus of quality material content and it's almost impossible to escape being moved by it unless uh, you're really, really closed to the world. And uh, therefore, we somehow need to take that step, that first step. And it doesn't mean traveling very far. You can look around, which brings me to the next point, perhaps, which is we have things around us that can move us. It could be a simple barn owl uh, screeching on the terrace at night. It could be a minor, it could be a parakeet, it could be a barbet. Uh, it could be any of these things, which a dragonfly, perhaps, which is a visitor to most uh, houses during the monsoon and post monsoon. So it's important not to think that you need to spend a lot of money, you need to travel far to be able to do this. Not at all. Uh, so, for instance, this is a picture of a, uh, a simple flower, uh, which uh, I found outside a resort where I was uh, staying, which is very easy to ignore. But if you actually bother to look at it, smell the flowers, as it were, as the cliche goes it becomes very beautiful. And during the lockdown, there was a lot of time. And this is a picture I took right from my terrace of a bat 
through the coconut leaves, uh, which makes it look very dramatic and uh, spe more spectacular than it probably is, more exotic for sure. But it was actually from my terrace, uh, black kite again, sitting on a pipe of some tank. So these are things which are available to us every moment. And we just go on being blind to them because perhaps we're just too busy uh, with our uh, routine, or maybe we don't see uh, the value in everyday things and so on. And then another picture of a kite and a plane, which I call uh, reverse evolution because it was pertinent uh, during the lockdown. So, which again, neatly brings me to the next point, which is, I think a great way of motivating oneself to explore the environment, to, to care enough for it, is to tie it up to a hobby. And uh, this could be bird watching, uh, like I've depicted here, or photography, or something else, maybe animal rescue or uh, volunteering of some sort. But particularly photography, I would like to talk about because that is how I can relate uh, to this whole process uh, chiefly. Is just incredibly effective in making you care because you suddenly open your eyes to the world in a way you'd never imagined before. I mean, a site like this is extremely hard to imagine with a naked eye because you simply don't see the world like this. So there's a spider in the middle of its web. And this picture was possible only from one angle for a microsecond. And after that, the sun moved and uh, this, this picture didn't even exist anymore. Um, or this, uh, you know, fern rustling in the wind, this egret taking off, this lion in backlight in Dutu in Africa. So the point is, you it's almost a supernatural power photography, you see, because you suddenly open up to the world the way you never saw it before. Which is why I think photography has a lot of potential uh, to help you to care uh, for the environment. And lastly, I think you can create projects for yourself. For instance, you can tell yourself that you will photograph or, or see uh, all the birds in the Western Ghats over the next two or three years, or you'll perhaps make a collection of um, all the insects around your house uh, or all the tigers in a national park or something like that. So creating projects gives you a goal and we love goals as human beings. Um, and it's a great motivator to do things. So I think it can really help. Okay, uh, then the next step, once you've had the opportunity to experience all this and expose yourself uh, to a little slice of a pristine environment, uh, the next step is proceeding through it with awareness and not ignorance and not wantonness. Uh, so here, I think I would not lecture too much. I will just say two things. I mean, just one, learn as much as possible about what you're trying to uh, engage with, because that makes you more humble, that makes you more respectful, that makes you more connected uh, to what you're doing. I mean, I see a lot of people uh, visit national parks. Uh, there's this semi-fictional character that I've uh, created called Thomas Travelmore. So Thomas Travelmore uh, once went to Bandhogad, which is a tiger reserve. And there uh, he was shown around. It's great for tigers. So he was shown around in a gypsy and uh, he was incredibly fortunate. Came across uh, an ambush of five tigers sitting in one place on a kill. So like, fantastic. Uh, then what, two minutes passed. And then he says, let's go from here. He tells the guide. The guide's like, why? Uh, I mean, there are five tigers here, where do you want to go? And he says, no, you have to show me the lions. So this is the problem with uh, visiting a place without really understanding anything about it. Bangalore doesn't have any lions. Uh, in fact, we don't have any national park where tigers and lions coexist in India. So it's important to learn a little bit about uh, what you're doing uh, so that you're more engaged with it. And then the next point, which is very, very important is to behave like a guest and not a tourist. So what's the difference between a guest and a tourist? Just imagine you are a guest at your friend's place. Would you actually put your feet up and order things around? Would you say, oh, get me coffee, um, get me that, get me this, I'll do this, I'll do that, and throw things around and be messy? Of course not, right? Whereas if you're a tourist, that's exactly what you do. I mean, because you don't feel obliged to be manful or mindful of anybody or anything. So here's an illustration of um, some of the things that tourists tend to do, which we shouldn't, uh, which we should, uh, you know, 
where we should behave more like a guest. So for instance, if the tiger moves into the shade, we complain that, oh, the light is gone. You know, as a photographer, so there's a danger of photography as well. I mentioned it's a great hobby, but we must be careful not to let it override the very reason we started it in the first place. I see a lot of people doing that and doing it at the expense of the subject that they love. So that, that's, uh, that's something that we need to be careful about. Um, then uh, hoping it uh, does not rain so that tigers will come to the water or trying to overtake a tiger to you know, get uh, pictures of it from the front. Uh, we see people doing that as well. Uh, in a gypsy, if you're following a tiger from behind, photographers are not happy that they're getting pictures from the back. So they try to overtake the tiger so that they can get pictures from the front. And the next thing you know, the tiger is obviously disturbed and gone doesn't even go to the water, uh, which it wanted to, which is an absolute tragedy, right? We've made it, we've denied it, one of its basic uh, requirements of water. So we have to be very careful to make sure that uh, in this whole process of trying to enjoy the value uh, of the environment, we don't prove to be a liability uh, to it. So responsible enjoyment is basically what we need to do. Okay, then uh, you have the last uh, stage, which is transmission, uh, which keeps the chain linked and keeps it going forward. So now that you have realized the value of it and you are enjoying it responsibly, it's time for you to transmit it to others so that they can do the same. And so the cycle the chain continues. So how do you do this? Um, I urge people to make it personal in the sense, don't always try to show what's popular or uh, there's nothing wrong in showing what's popular, but if that doesn't mean anything to you personally, then that zing will be missing, that, that um, X factor will not be there. Uh, so whatever, even if what you like is cliched or very mainstream, like say tigers, tigers are your thing, that's what you love the most. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it because that is how you relate to the ecology, to the environment, and therefore there's nothing wrong in showing tiger pictures. So be authentic and true to yourself is what I would say. For instance, I have a very strong connection with Africa, uh, Kenya and Tanzania in particular, East Africa. Um, so I am absolutely unabashed in sharing pictures of Africa, even though there might be more urgent concerns or things within my own country or my own state or my own city. Uh, the second thing that I would suggest is to tell stories, uh, you know, because that helps someone relate to what you're showing much more than otherwise. Uh, for instance, if you just posted a tiger picture, well, yeah, okay, it's a good picture, it's a eye level, whatever, and a nice background, bouquet, et cetera. All the technical things are in place, great, well and good. But the moment you point out that this tiger has stripes on his forehead, which look like the word cat, C-A-T, suddenly you have an extra dimension uh, to it. Suddenly you've turned the tiger into an individual, which a person can relate to. So no longer is it just a tiger, but it is that tiger with cat on its face. Of course, the uh, other consequences or repercussions of anthropomorphizing animals is a different debate. I will not go into that. There are challenges with that as well, but essentially story, we love stories. Human beings love stories. So stories help us relate to content much more than uh, you know we would otherwise. So I think we should leverage the power of storytelling whenever we try to transmit this environmental consciousness that we've developed. I think it will come as a natural consequence. If you feel strongly enough about something, you will make an effort to share some information or some story behind uh, what you experienced and what you witnessed and what is there in the picture, then you know, just sharing it just like that. Lastly, don't be competitive is what I would say. Uh, I mean, the, this is unfortunately uh, a fallout of uh, the social media culture that we have, that we are always competing for likes, for views, uh, for comments and so on. It's a very natural human phenomenon. And I think the social media are a relatively new uh, thing uh, for us, for humans to deal with. So I'm sure we will uh, adapt, uh, but this is very damaging to the overall uh, mission you know, that we're trying to achieve by putting the animals there at the forefront, the environment at the forefront and not ourselves. Uh, you know, the point is uh, the beauty of the content that we're showing and not that we are great to have shown it. 
so i think that will come naturally if we understand this one particular quote that i love from sir david attenborough which is that i mean we say this in uh, spirituality as well right uh, a lot of uh, philosophers say this spiritualists say this and it's great that a naturalist has said it as well because this is the way of nature the way of nature is to make sure that everybody does well that everybody thrives i mean it's not because just because a lion or a tiger is killing a deer that uh, the tiger is superior and the deer is inferior or, uh, all the deer are absolutely exterminated that is obviously not the case at all you take what is necessary for your survival you take what is necessary for your well being i think this is also part of the problem that we have set the the bar for well being very very high we say that we need uh, you know that big car we need uh, you know the fleet of four or five cars we need a huge house with a lot of granite so i think the moment we spend more time in nature and tune ourselves to nature's rhythms we realize we actually don't need all that much to be happy and content and uh, uh, secure and nice within ourselves so i think that is increasingly what we need to do so that we can move from looking at the world like what i've depicted on the left which is man or humans being at the center of the planet and all the animals being below or underneath or less important uh, less populous to being just a cog on the right it's actually much less pressure on us humans so it's much better to think of ourselves in this way like i've depicted on the right and it's also more fun because you have so much to explore so much to look at rather than uh, you know ourselves all the time so with that thought i think i've come to the end of the presentation and uh, thank you very much so that was brilliant santosh uh, uh, great insights into what we do without uh, possibly realizing the impact of what we are doing but i think uh, having been on a lot of safaris with and without you i think these are very very obvious learnings and uh, if we can ad- adapt even uh, you know a, a minuscule percentage of that i think the parks and all of us would be far better and i think uh, one thing i would like to ask you santosh uh the the pandemic highlighted that there is a whole ecosystem of humans itself which was dependent on these parks and the wildlife uh, part of it uh, and uh, these uh, ladies and gentlemen who were dependent on that except the government employees were really hit by it and uh, some of uh, um, our groups contributed in some measure but what has been your experience through the pandemic though the animals would have loved our absence yeah no absolutely it's been very very tough on the locals the guides and the drivers uh, even the forest guards maybe um, so it's been very tough on them uh, some organizations have come forward uh like you mentioned uh, to help i mean there were some photographers who contributed um built up a fund and distributed uh, food and so on uh largely however because their lifestyles are a lot simpler and they don't have a hundred different loans to pay and uh, i mean of course i'm generalizing here the case would be unique and different uh but generally compared to an urbanite since on average they have a simpler lifestyle i think they've been able to cope with this a lot better than a lot of us urban uh, employed uh, people as well as businessmen have been uh, but having said that there's a limit to everything and uh, this is probably why uh, both mp and uh, rajasthan have opened up parks a little early this time through the second wave uh, also apart from the fact that uh, a lot of people have been vaccinated uh, is because if you remember the last year at the same time uh, the park remained shut through the summer and all the way through the monsoon into the winter but this time they have not done that simply because of the uh, enormity of the scale of loss that these people will uh, experience if they do that and also let's not forget there are resorts and all sorts of uh, hospitality elements also tied up to this all of whom uh, will go by a begging so well uh, there's uh, no easy answers <laughs> uh, because yes for the sake of their livelihood we cannot take a risk and travel during these times uh, but maybe the local scan people living around and who are vaccinated can responsibly travel and help them uh, but maybe there are other ways that we can think of to raise 
points for them. But overall, hopefully together we'll see through uh, this period. You mentioned uh, East Africa, uh, Santosh, and uh, having been there a lot of times myself, I find there is a sense of uh, uh, discipline to the tourism industry in East Africa, which I found lacking in India. Would you uh, share your thoughts on that? Um, yes and no, Rajesh. Actually, uh, I, I find in my experience that people, especially between Africa and India, are similar to a large extent in that, given an opportunity, they will still break rules. Given an opportunity, there'll still be chaos. Given an opportunity, there'll still be indiscipline and so on. Uh, but what I find in India here is because of the way the forest, the habitat itself is, um, that creates a lot more chaos than it would in a place like, uh, say, Dutu in uh, Tanzania or even the Mara, even though off-roading in uh, the Mara is not allowed. Um, at least because the habitat is open, it seems like it can accommodate more vehicles or and in fact, uh, let's not forget vehicles there are larger as well, much larger than our uh, GC. Yeah. Right. But if, you, if you've been to the Mara during the migration, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's actually pretty bad. Uh, so I think uh, there's a need to uh, adopt measures both uh, of awareness creation as well as uh, disciplining measures in both these places. But I do agree that in India, it seems worse because of the way the habitat is mainly. Thank you so much, Santosh, for being with us Pleasure and sharing real good insights. Thank you. Pleasure, Rajesh. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So we've just heard Santosh talk about uh, the basics of uh, how do we conserve and how do we spread the word, how do we love nature and what we can do and what we should not do. I think I'm going to now invite um, an uh, eminent uh, photographer and uh, environment activist, uh, Ms. Shabnam Stiki, who has this bias on birds, but I think she'll come up with a few more concepts. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much, Rajesh. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, joining you all on this special day. Uh, the World Environment Day of 2021, uh, wherein this year we launched the Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. Uh, the idea behind all these days uh, is that the focus uh, should come on uh, what is essential, what is required, and how do we, as uh, a species, one of the species that inhabit the earth, uh, can take forward our responsibility and legacy forward. So it's a pleasure to uh, share our ideas uh, on uh, with the audience here. I think uh, uh, this decade, this uh, 2021 to 2030 has been declared as the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. The idea being uh, that all stakeholders together will aim to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystems on every continent and in every ocean. It looks and sounds like a Herculean task, but if uh, everybody is involved, uh, it just becomes easier. It can help to end poverty, combat climate change, and prevent mass extinction of species. And uh, as I'm, I was mentioning, it will only work, it will only succeed if everybody plays their part. When we talk about ecosystems, uh, uh, especially nature, uh, we take a lot of things for granted. Uh, we know the cost of a lot of things, but we don't know the value of most things. And this is very true in the case of uh, ecosystems. Uh, uh, some statistics uh, to share uh, with the audience is that uh, forests provide drinking water to one third of the world's largest cities. And they also support uh, amphibians, birds, mammal species uh, to a large extent. At least 2 billion people depend on the agricultural sector for their livelihoods, particularly the poor and rural populations. Peatlands store nearly 30% of global soil carbon. These are statistics uh, that come out of research, but for a, a regular citizen, uh, especially in the cities of uh, Mumbai and other places, uh, we realize that street trees uh, provide a direct reduction of temperature from 0.5 to 2 degrees in summer. Uh, so if you go from a tree without a street without trees to a street with trees, you uh, imagine the cooling off. And especially in Bombay, uh, 
anybody who passes through the ra ecosystem realizes that uh, the temperature both in summer and uh, winter is uh, is different from the outside so these are the kind of benefits uh, uh, especially the city uh, street and urban uh, atmosphere that uh, 68 million uh, people benefit from and overall uh, the benefits for ecosystem restoration as we talking about uh, uh, is has a lot of benefits uh, because for every dollar invested in restoration at least 7 to 30 dollars in re in returns for society can be expected uh, restoration also creates jobs in rural areas where they are most needed uh, this is something that even uh, was hinted by the speaker earlier about uh, like you know the french communities uh, uh, living on the fringes of the forest or forest dependent uh, or like you know communities uh, they do get a lot of benefits as as do all of us uh, uh, to a large extent some countries recently because the pandemic has been a great realization uh, as to the value of ecosystems uh, some countries have already invested in restoration as part of their strategies to bounce back from covid-19 so the covid recovery packages in many countries uh, include ecosystem restorations and others are trying to uh, 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 turn to restoration to help them adapt to a climate that is already changing uh, i here uh, in this discussion represent uh, the united nations global compact uh, it's a uh, business it's a voluntary business association it's a un initiative which works closely with businesses uh, the un global compact uh, was formed uh, in the year 2000 under the leadership of kofi annan the then secretary general and the idea was that businesses commit to principles uh, uh, for taking care of nature because they are part of the problem they needed to be a part of the solution and the compact was around uh, four issue areas human rights environment labor and anti corruption the three specific uh, principles that uh, directly relate to environment uh, is principle 7 8 and 9 which talks about businesses how businesses should support a precautionary approach to environmental challenges how do they undertake initiatives to promote greater environment responsibility and then encourage the development and diffusion of environment friendly technologies uh, a couple of years ago when the sustainable development goals uh, came into the picture uh, these principles resonated uh, in sdg 13 that talks about climate action and sdg 15 that talks about life on land and sitting at the intersection of the united nations and the private sector uh, the global compact is uh, uniquely positioned to advance corporate action on the sdgs and we consider it both uh, an honor and responsibility uh, to work towards environmental restoration uh, what we have been doing in india uh, is that to accelerate the progress uh, we are calling on corporate efforts to increase stewardship of natural resources to implement innovative solutions and contribute to sustainable development we realize that this is not uh, one person's or one corporate's job uh, so uh, we time and again give the call for cl collective action because uh, ecosystem restoration will require uh, collective action of all uh, corporates citizens uh, forest officials uh, individuals together and especially uh, a recently launched uh, race to zero uh, campaign uh, we are part of uh, which talks about adopting responsible practices for the transition to net for a transition to net zero at the india level uh, we are also looking at uh, developing a strategic plan with businesses on board uh, about india's contribution to global deliberations uh, for reversing the structure of power relations and uh, uh, i think where legacies also could play a role is that we are planning to set uh, accountability standards for corporations to report on biodiversity loss and adopt rigorous safeguards for private sector involvement while strengthening and protecting the rights of indigenous people and communities or uh, with this like you know dual approach uh, uh, we'll allow facilitate community based biodiversity protecting uh, solutions to flourish the challenges that always come up in such kind of collective action is of choosing the right partners and periodically uh, uh, auditing through external agencies uh, prioritizing innovation in programs uh, identifying uh, forest dependent communities as beneficiaries building on internal capacities and sessions for vendors funding uh, resource generation is always a challenge because you might get uh, anybody who is working in the space of uh, uh, ecosystem restoration realizes that uh, resources are available in fits and starts so sometimes uh, there's an absence of long term reliable funding uh, many a times community led initiatives uh, do not get integrated into design uh, sometimes uh, there are investment into programs uh, uh, to appease political interest and sometimes there is a corporate impunity for social and environmental impacts 
so transparency in fund management and uh, uh, like you know external audits and accountability is crucial uh, for this framework to go forward uh, what we did at the global compact was uh, uh, we had a series of stakeholder consultations across different cities uh, to see uh, how we should embark on this process and uh, some of the learnings from the uh, consultation process was that uh, collective action and multi stakeholder partnerships is crucial uh, active uh, participation and involvement of uh, ceos of the leadership and then uh, working in silos that most companies do uh, in environmental projects uh, needs to be avoided as much as possible we also realized that as of today western ghats is one of the most important biodiversity hotspots in the country and uh, uh, a lifeline for water because uh, water is a huge challenge uh, in the coming uh, decades uh, so we need to start working on it right away uh, again landscape approach is crucial for conservation uh, because things cannot be solved in isolation uh, corporate action has to be gradually shift from uh, like you know uh, corporate backyards uh, to ecologically sensitive zones uh, this is something that we discussed uh, uh, in a global event uh, just last week and there was a uh, unanimous agreement to this kind of corporate action uh, again communities need to be involved for conservation uh, because they have the early buy in from communities ensures the sustainability of any kind of uh, restoration projects uh businesses can and should make a commitment for 2030 for protecting and restoring natural habitats and now this ties in beautifully uh with the un decade of economic uh restoration uh some other learnings were that financial sanctioning of forests needs to increase many fold because forests contribute 2.3 per 7% of to gdp uh well in the budget uh allocation uh, the only standard 0.5% uh specific legislations for biodiversity are needed because states don't have laws and the biodiversity registers uh, in most states are not updated uh, the csr funds in forests uh, and villages is uh, too little uh, uh, and too late uh, so they like you know it's drop in the ocean but uh, uh, there can be much more impact if planned well uh, forest revenue does not reach the communities uh, except for uh, one or two states whose forests are much more organized and then uh, also corporates uh, at uh, need to shift from csr to sustainability because uh, uh, they have to move, move from uh, doing uh, no harm to doing more good and that is going beyond csr so core biodiversity conservation and company policies uh, is uh, crucial and that uh, we are requesting company uh, to reinvent their strategies uh, sal trees uh, uh, has came up as a need of attention because uh, 22 of the uh, from 22 out of the 29 states some thematic areas that we had explored uh, was uh, what were the issue areas that we could work at and if you can see the uh, largest pillars was about ecosystem based adaptation and ecosystem based conservation uh, which is what this decade is also talking about and some geographies in india uh, that we looked at uh, that we can start this work was uh, gujarat uh, jharkhand odisha chatisgarh maharashtra madhya pradesh uttarakhand uttar pradesh tamil nadu and karnataka and finally uh, what i would like to say is that uh, for any kind of uh, uh, new things that we uh, like you know begin and plan and implement there's a big need to reimagine recreate and restore uh, this is the specific moment we cannot turn back in time but we can definitely uh, grow trees green our cities rewild our gardens change our diets and clean up rivers and coasts uh, we believe that we are the generation that can make peace with nature and we should however uh, we should not let the challenge be so daunting uh, that we get anxious but let's get active and what requires uh, in terms of action is not to be timid but to be bold in our practices so that is it from my side for now thank you so much thank you uh, sapan ji very great a uh, great uh, piece of advice and uh, nice thoughts for us to think about i guess uh, the this present generation is far more aware and i think listening at least if not uh, acting as much but uh, i am sure action will follow the listening that has happened in the last 10 15 years and uh, what actually santosh and uh, shabnam ji what actually inspires me the most is when i see young kids around uh, national parks or in safari jeeps or in the wild uh, with their parents and i think those are the people who are more likely to respond and feel the need and uh, 
possibly take leaps and bounds of progress uh, on this front. And uh, I'm sure they will. And uh, something that all of us must do. Uh, I, I also like some of the efforts made by wildlife enthusiasts like Santosh and various other people in, um, actually Santosh has been involved in tours which have been organized only for young people. The young people with small little cameras, points and shoots and others going out into the wild and, you know, interacting with people like Santosh and other people. And, you know, you see sometimes even the, I'm sure uh, Santosh would you like to come in on that and give us some insight because that is, I think, one of the most heartening uh, spaces here. Yes, absolutely, Rajesh. Uh, in fact, we talk about catching them young and all of that. But honestly, children are naturally curious, inquisitive and interested in everything. And somewhere, obviously, they lose that because they get uh, caught up in this typical urban, uh, you know, hang up of uh, just technological devices and virtual everything and so on. Uh, so it's a great, I mean, I have really enjoyed those opportunities to bring them back to where their natural habitat is, psychologically speaking, um, and uh, see them go. And they're absolutely, uh, they really enjoy themselves. And uh, they also infect the adults with their enthusiasm. Um, so I think we should definitely do more of that. Uh, and it's uh, more important now than ever before because we live in apartments far away from uh, natural places and so on. So it's utterly critical to catch those kids and give them a taste of uh, what they have forgotten to enjoy so that they can be the custodians of the future. Chabnamji, any story on corporate? Some uh, really nice ones to finish on a positive note. Well, I think it's a, uh, uh, so what I've done is like, I myself uh, am from Bombay and far removed from nature, was far removed from nature a decade ago. Uh, the maximum we go to is some hill nearby, which is like completely uh, uh, not the kind of scene. And uh, once I moved to Delhi and I started exploring the forest myself, uh, I was completely, I'm fascinated. I'm uh, fascinated with everything uh, that I see uh, uh, in terms of animal behavior, in terms of how the forest works by itself. So I don't go with expectations. And uh, what I've been doing is, as Santosh was mentioning, uh, I created this small, uh, because WhatsApp is the very effective way of communication. I've, I created this uh, uh, broadcast list, for example, in which I share pictures, but beyond pictures, I share stories. Like, you know, about the background. So, for example, uh, if I'm talking about a migratory bird, I'll tell them the kind of distance that it travels. And for people who are completely not aware of any animal behavior, that's fascinating. They don't understand that birds travel the same distance, perch on the same trees year on year. Uh, and, uh, uh, like, you know, the kind of uh, animal intelligence being far superior to human intelligence. And what impact it did have was, like, for the last couple of years, Many more of my corporate uh, uh, groups uh, are now trying to engage more with forest to understand them and their families and their uh, corporate offices to see what can work. Earlier, it was like giving uh, money to one particular uh, like you know agency and getting work done, but now uh, like this entire aspect of doing uh, less harm is important because it's not only uh, for example about uh, mangrove conservation. But how much are you destroying in terms of your uh, services? And if you're destroying, what is the kind of accountability that you hold yourself that might not come into your balance sheet or your reporting mechanism? So I think that consciousness has uh, played a great deal because what uh, we have been trying to do is not to preach, is just to make people aware. And once they are aware, they can have their own strategies, they can have their own direction, and we can support them in whatever they're doing. So I think that uh, conscious uh, change has happened in the corporates at an interpersonal level, which definitely has a, like, you know, uh, impact on their work. And uh, uh, the side part, the down part is that uh, during lockdown and other places, I've got pictures of uh, too many uh, pigeons and minas and kites uh, because people who have been so fascinated with birds that they're clicking and sending every picture that their mobile can get uh, hands on. But I find that even as a positive gesture that people are noticing and observing uh, what is around them. So I think those are definitely positive things, which if continued uh, would lead to something, I hope. Thank you so much, uh, Shabnamji and uh, Santosh. Uh, let's get on with the program now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajesh. 
So friends, we've just heard uh, some uh, great insights from Santosh on um, the entire uh, effort that needs to go into appreciating, loving, and also spreading the love for nature and the need for conservation. And then now uh, we heard uh, Shabnam ma'am, where she pointed out what is being done uh, under the AGs of the United Nations for getting the corporates around the world uh, to focus on and take positive action on enhancing the environment. Now, I think uh, this was really some um, uh, uh, really serious stuff. So let me take you through a journey where you can cherish and experience uh, nature as Santosh put it, uh, virtually of course, uh, till the pandemic is on. And thereafter, I would urge you to step out with your families and try and enjoy that firsthand. I'll also try and tell you the story behind that uh, uh, visual experience. So we are going to be looking at uh, principally the caring and the loving part and always keeping our mind open to the ways and means by which we could enhance uh, uh, the, the concern and also contribute to the effort to conserve and protect nature. Next one, please. So here you see a tigress who's about to cross the Ram Ganga at uh, Kobet National Park in uh, Uttarakhand, India. If we look at this picture, it's very clear that this tigress needs more space. She needs that pristine environment, which is untouched. So you don't need to have go and clip the bushes or uh, you know, polish the uh, stones, things like that. Leave it as it is and nature takes care of it. Please remember that the river is just uh, flowing out of the Himalayas. So it is very, very clean and pristine, full of fish, which also supports a whole lot of bird and other land. Next one, please. Here you see two tigers in the national parks of India. Now, all this has been possible because of the Project Tiger, which has been such a, such a success. And what it has done is it has created a fortress around those wildlife areas and has protected those environments for these lovely animals. And not only them, there are thousands of other species which, have, which continue to live and thrive in these forests. Let's always remember that it is not only one animal which is making that park, it is those thousands of others because it's a full ecosystem, right from the smallest of insects to the most exotic bird, to the water life of fish and other creatures and the other animals such as the antelope, the pachyderms, as well as the tigers and other predators like leopards and everyone thrives there and it's such a lovely sight when you are there to see all of them or individually and also interacting with each other it's brilliant and of course these uh, species do not live in environments which are dirty which are polluted so therefore you have those clean uh, environments fresh air it's, it's always an experience to get up before dawn and enter these parks early morning with that fresh whiff of clean air striking you. People are gasping for oxygen these days, but you just need to go there and you'll get a full quota of one year's fresh air in those couple of hours. Next one, please. So as I said, there are other species and here you have a lovely green magpie and a brown wood owl in all their majestic glory, living in those very forests. Now these are somewhere close to the Corbett National Park. And these parks actually generate a 
a protected environment for these species so that we don't lose them. And when, uh, just to tell you, it took me nine trips to that location where green magpies thrive to see one. And that's the thrill of these species that you need to strive, you need to go there often, enjoy that part. And even if you don't see them, you can still go back and look for them. I would go any day if I get a news that the brown wood owl is showing at such and such place. So uh, try and make it to these places. It's always a wonderful experience whether you have a sighting or not. Next one, please. So it's not only the forests and the green areas which support wildlife. Now here is a brown-headed gull soaring in the Ladakh Valley. Ladakh, as you know, is a desert with very less uh, vegetation growing. Vegetation grows only around the rivers and the rivulets. But uh, these, these birds have their own way of finding food as whole lot of insect and other life thrives there. So she's soaring over the Bangmong Lake, which was in the news uh, recently for all the wrong reasons. But it's a fantastic ecosystem uh, sharing banks with both India and China. And it is a lovely place to visit in the summertime. Next one, please. So they, these are two uh, raptors, as we call them, two falcons from the uh, uh, western desert of uh, India, uh, primarily Gujarat and Rajasthan, uh, where I saw them. So the one on the left is the peregrine falcon, which is found mostly all around the world with a little bit of change in the morph here and there. And the uh, one on the right with its wings out up is the red-necked falcon. Uh, both these falcons thrive in uh, India and visit India during the winters mostly and can be viewed when you go to those parts. Who would have uh, imagined that in a desert you would try find such lovely birds? Next one, please. Now, these are two trogons uh, from different parts of the country. Uh, one on the left, uh, right, red chest with a white stripe is the Malabar trogon, which is found on the uh, western coast uh, of India, right from uh, southern Maharashtra till Kerala and uh, somewhere in between as well in the Nilgiris. And a beautiful uh, Malabar trogon, uh, very uh, quiet, both of them. Uh, the habits are similar. And as Santosh said, we need to read about them, learn about them to really appreciate what life do they lead and what kind of hardships they face when their habitat is restricted or encroached upon. It's nice to build lovely hotels and uh, villas in the hills and in the forests, but what it does is it disturbs their environment and therefore both these species are contracting in the places in which you find them and in numbers they are dwindling. The one on the right is a, a really threatened species called the ward strogon. He, uh, uh, he, this is a male, so he lives primarily in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, in the upper reaches of Arunachal Pradesh and uh, very, very shy bird and quite rare to sight. So we were lucky when we were driving up the Mishmi Hills one morning and uh, we, we heard the call uh, on the roadside where we had stopped. And we were, we were, we were very fortunate that this gentleman came up and uh, showed himself to us for some brief moments, maybe about half a minute, and then flew away to his other duties of the day. But his habitat too has shrunk quite considerably. And that's a, that's, a, that's a sad part that if we continue to ravage the environment or encroach upon these pristine forests, these species could actually disappear as some of them have. 
The next one, please. These are two more birds. Uh, the left one is the yellow brow fulveta, and the uh, one on the right, uh, on the twin branch, is the golden babbler. Both of them very shy, very tiny, hardly about three inches long, both, both of them. And you have to wait. And for both of them, we had to wait nearly an hour each for them to come out. While you can hear them very regularly in the bushes and uh, even on roadside, but they, 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 they don't show up very often. And so you have to wait patiently, quietly, and so that they gain the confidence to come and show up. But it's such a uh, exhilarating experience that you really uh, uh, nurse, you know, keep it in your heart for all times to come. And thanks to photography, you can actually capture that moment and share it with others. Uh, but I think birders also need to be responsible, as Santosh said, think about the subject as well. Do not disturb the subject and do not leave a scar either on the space or on the subject. The next one, please. Now, we, we, we shift to East Africa, and that's the place where these animals uh, thrive. Uh, these are photos. The one of the tigress on the tree is from Ndutu at Tanzania. The place is beautiful. The trees are lovely. And it's a pristine, untouched forest, as you can see. So nice greens and blues. And the one on the center with the lioness walking with three cubs is also from due to uh, from a place very near to where the left one was shot and the one on the right is the black maned uh, uh, lion the king of uh, uh, a pride in uh, Kenya so all these predators need a lot of space the pride needs a territory which is large enough to support them they need an antelope uh, supply to feed them, the lion actually needs a kill every third day uh, to sustain. And if the pride is very large, the pride needs to kill uh, very, very regularly. And especially if the mother has cubs, then she needs to be fed and so that she can uh, provide the nutrition to the babies. Next one, please. Just imagine being in such a place with water lilies uh, and a stream of, with clean water. You can actually see the floor of the stream through the water, so that means it's really clean. And uh, the king has decided to take a drink. Uh, what a handsome uh, male. And uh, he, was, he was nearby. Uh, and um, we thought he will get thirsty at some point in time and come to the stream for a drink. So we had positioned ourselves on a, a, a place uh, decently far from the stream and waited for the gentleman to come. And sure enough, he came and uh, took a drink and went back. But what is of uh, uh, note here is that these tourists must be kept a little distance away from these animals because in their desire to take a better shot or a close-up, the vehicles could go far closer and disturb the animals. And that is what is not uh, desirable at all. And it's best that we, you know, curb our instincts to go and be close to the animals because really, they must be left to lead their own lives the way they do and without you know, interrupting or disturbing their normal lifestyle. Next one, please. So here uh, we were at uh, Serengeti, the uh, endless plains uh, with short grass in uh, Tanzania, which is dotted by these large rocks which are called poopies. And uh, there, most of the time, you could find the lions and their 
uh, prides going on top of the cookies. Here is a lioness uh, with her daughter who is yawning behind her on top of the kopi, looking at uh, a gathering storm. I don't know whether she had seen the movie Lion King, but uh, she's giving the same pose. And the storm was there and uh, we were with this uh, family. Oh, there's another son, a uh, uh, young fellow behind them. Now we were with the family for nearly four hours from the afternoon till late in the evening. And all day long, it was sunny, hot and sweaty. But then the clouds started appearing and this is when the storm starts appearing. And uh, the, the next frame is where the storm strikes. The next one, please. So now you can see the clouds getting dark and black. And there's a little bit of sunlight on the, the mother is in the middle, the daughter is on the left and the sun is sprawled in on the uh, rock to the left of the screen. Now, this magical moment could have been lost had we not had the patience of remaining with the family. We could see in the eyes of the mother and the kids that they were hungry. She was on the top of the uh, rock basically to look out for uh, approaching prey nearby because she needs it uh, nearby so that she can go and hunt it down but she was unsuccessful but, and then the storm came. Immediately hereafter, the, it started raining and before we started running, we took some pictures of them alighting from the rocks because the animals are intelligent and very, very sharp. The moment it started raining, they knew that the rocks would get slippery and dangerous for them to be on top so they immediately came down and vanished into the, uh, you know, the bush. Next one, please. So this is a, a shot of the Grand Lake in uh, uh, Ranthambore, uh, which is near Jaipur uh, Wildlife Park. And uh, here you see uh, Riti, one of the tigresses crossing the, uh, the lake. Now, I've been going there for about six years and every time I thought, what would it be like if the tigress crossed this very spot where I could get a picture of the entire lake and the fort uh, remains uh, behind the, uh, you know, in the island. And there is also a palace behind the tree, which is the uh, Rajbagh Palace as they call it which is now a guest house for uh, dignitaries. Now, this uh, site will tell you how vast the forest is. Please remember, the entire territory you see belongs to the mother of this uh, tigress who's walking by, who's a young adult, now coming into adulthood and fighting for its own territory. And that much space and much more actually is needed for a tiger to sustain. She needs to eat, she needs to rest, she needs to uh, deliver kids, bring them up and then they come and find their own space in the forest. So we are thankful uh, to Project Tiger and the Indian Forest Service for maintaining and conserving these territories and these magnificent animals for us to see. So I would urge you to go out with your families to these parks and have a look, but do not leave anything as they say, except footprints there and try and appreciate that and contribute in whichever way you can. Next one, please. What is most heartening for me in these wildlife parks, and please remember, uh, since we are looking at two cheetah cubs with a, uh, uh, a calf of uh, uh, antelope. Now, 
cheetah is also an endangered animal like the tiger because of various reasons territory being lost etc etc but when you see cubs of the cheetah like this and this is really a training session organized by the mother of the cheetahs who is sitting nearby and she has caught this uh, calf of the uh, 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 I, th I think uh, i'll get the name of the antelope and given it to the cubs to practice how to chase it down chase down a prey and ultimately how to kill it and eat it now they they continue to uh, practice or play with the antelope's uh, calf for about an hour and we were there all along sadly after we had shot some pictures and videos of this uh, happening we went we, we we were wanting to go and have breakfast so wanted to go far but as sad as as it would appear but that's the rule of the jungle we saw <coughs> a male and a female antelope the parents of this calf standing about maybe 500 600 meters away and watching the entire exercise they can't do a thing because the mother chita is also there and she would uh, hunt them down now it was it was really sad because you could see that they were in their eyes how disturbed and distressed they were we went up at breakfast and there was a nearby hill on which we went had breakfast and we came down and you won't believe it the cheetahs had by then eaten the calf and gone away but those two parents were still standing there uh, it was it was really painful to see that but what was heartening was that cheetahs were reproducing and there was still hope for the project cheeta run by kimya where they actually provide a jeep and a guard for every cheeta female who has had cubs so that she is not attacked by hyenas or hyenas do not take away her kill before she and her cubs can eat so uh, so that is the kind of care they are taking of each cheeta mother but still it it is really uh, tough imagine bringing up your young ones in the thick of the forest with no protection no uh, facilities no uh, clinics to get the kids treated if they have a common cold or a or a, a broken leg so it, it's very really tough and still they continue to produce babies and those babies also grow up into adults not all do some of them and still the population is thriving and increasing hats off to the conservation efforts all over the world uh, next one please one would give uh, my, you know the right arm for looking at this these are two cubs riddhi and siddhi of the tigress king queen of the lake arrowhead at uh, rantham board and uh, they make such a lovely pair but now they are adults so they will go their individual ways and even fight with their mother and each other to gain a territory and we wish them all the luck and they are doing very well right now and they are now fully grown tigresses and uh, hope to see them produce more babies and get joy into our lives thank you so much it has been a pleasure and uh, next one please so if you wish to uh, experience enjoy and contribute to these lovely animals please do visit these parks and uh, or even in the neighborhood so people in bombay could visit the ghats and on the way to lonavla or around uh, alibag anywhere 
Delhi, of course, is very close to various national parks. So is Bangalore, Hyderabad, Calcutta. And it's amazing that how uh, the children learn faster than we do. It's been a pleasure bringing this program to you and to share some thoughts. And I hope we have added to some, some fun to your lives in this pandemic and also given you something to ponder about, something to think about, and also to appreciate nature. Thank you.